or and a pointer. I don't need one. Well, this is the ultimate diversity to ask a chemical physicist to speak with all of you to wrap up the session this afternoon. I have to say, I've said throughout most of my career that anybody that studies anything that moves, replicates, or burps is more and more courageous than I. I tend to study inanimate objects, largely with big fancy lasers and electronics. But I want to share with you some ideas just quickly this afternoon to think about at this meeting as well as when you go home. And that has to do with diversity in science and how critically important it is for all of us to be committed to this. And I thank uh, JGI for uh, inviting me to be here with you today. So why bother? I certainly hear this. I hear this. Why bother with diversity? Now, for those of you that are postdocs or applying for positions and you have to write a diversity statement, you might get a little bit nervous about this because many of the institutions believe very strongly about it, but a lot of times we don't have a lot of background or to be able to put together a good statement. In fact, I heard a story recently where uh, an applicant put into a university on their diversity statement, they put, they understand diversity because they're bald. Well, that's true, it is diverse. But why bother? Because oftentimes we think simply your intellectual prowess is enough. Isn't that enough? If we're all just smart enough, get the smartest people in the room, isn't that enough? Well, let me share with you a few ideas and thoughts about why it's not enough. So there's substantial research out there that shows that actually, in this case, companies with ethnic and culturally diverse groups are 35% more likely to show profitability. Large businesses with women on their boards outperform those with men only boards. Boards that include women are found to have higher returns on investments. These are just a few of a lot of the data that's out there. And companies with more diverse groups also have a higher retention rate uh, and less turnover. Organizations with more inclusive cultures have an easier time recruiting. So let's talk a minute about what innovation is all about innovation and high impact research. Let's first assume that you have everybody in the room that's really smart. But there are other issues that associated with that too. The top two is good innovation and high impact research requires good leadership, takes sponsorship, sponsorship defined by money, and just sponsorship in general. It relies on effective teamwork. I've seen these slides today of so many different organizations and groups that are associated with your team activities. It's critically important in genomics. There's no question. And communication. But let me talk about the last two of these. Thrives on diversity in all dimensions and flourishes in an inclusive and supportive work environment. Let's talk about the last one first. So information with regards to diversity. Information diversity. This is not the crowd that I need to convince that you need to have a lot of different people in the room with a lot of different backgrounds. You know that. You know that. I've seen slides all over about that, certainly more, more so than in my field. But it does depend on all participants bringing different views, different ideas, different backgrounds to the table. That's important. We all know that, intellectual diversity, interdisciplinary research, multidisciplinary research. But you have to have that inclusive environment to make sure that everybody's voices are heard, that everybody's voices are welcomed and heard. And that's all the way from the graduate student up to the leader of the group. And I'll come back to this in a minute. But it also thrives on social diversity. And this is the one that sometimes people struggle with, the need for social diversity in your team, gender, race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, age, and so forth. And so what do we know about why this is so important? We know that it enhances creativity and results in better decision making. There are many studies that have shown this. And if you want to read a really good Scientific American article, uh, there was one that put out a number of years ago on this. I have it uh, referenced here. And then uh, in 2016 with the new election, uh, it was republished again with presidential election. So the downside of social diversity is that it can cause discomfort. You're working with people that you may not be accustomed to working with. They're different than you are. They look different than you. They might be from a different country. And sometimes that just doesn't make the connection as easily as someone that you've been working with all the time or have very common ideas. 
But the upside of that means is it means that we have to work harder to work with each other, and that's what brings out the creativity. Because you think about it, when you're doing your research, if you're always working with people who always think the same way, always think about the same approaches, that you may actually end up going the wrong direction, in a very narrow direction. And so being able to have those different opinions and actually disagree and be uncomfortable is very valuable, and it shows, again, by research, that this leads to a lot more creativity than if you just have homogeneous groups. And all stages of problem solving can benefit from this sort of discomfort of different coming through with different opinions and backgrounds and cultures. Look, possible problem identification, looking for solutions, making a decision and implementation. But also along with that, as I alluded to a minute ago, is that you need to have an inclusive environment when you have that diversity to make sure everybody's voices are heard, that everybody gets to speak. And I have to say in my over 40 years of doing research that, and uh, having many graduate students and postdocs, some of the best research that we've done over the years has come when a graduate student walked into my office and disagreed with the direction that we're going, the direction that I thought might be the most productive. Those actually, and my, I was wise enough to listen to them and let them try it. And I'm sure that some of you in the audience have the same experience as I. So that means equal treatment and opportunity for everybody. And as I give you these final thoughts about this, I want you to think about it with this meeting too. When you listen to people, when you listen to people's talks, when you meet people in the, in the hallways there, think about listening to the voices. Appreciating the individual uniqueness of social connectedness and group membership, and the high team performance that can come when people have the confidence to speak up. Creating an inclusive working environment, as many of you know because you're involved in team activities, is really key. Now for some, some from different countries, some from different cultures. So the um, one thing that I've been involved in over the last 20 years is to create opportunities to train women scientists from all levels to be more outspoken in their views, to increase their confidence, to learn how to negotiate. And one thing I run upon a lot is a lot of women that just are afraid to disagree with their boss. And actually a lot from students from other cultures, other countries, disagree with their boss, when in actual fact, we need to listen to that disagreement as long as it's done in a professional manner. It's important to innovation. But there's also very interesting research that came out recently. This is from the Billie Jean Leadership Initiative, that there's generation differences uh, in desirable workplaces. So baby movers and Gen Xers view workplace diversity in legal and moral terms. And regardless of what the bottom line is, so it's really a fairness issue. And those under 40, uh, the millennials, consider diversity to be to a necessary building block for innovation. An inclusive and teamwork-oriented culture is essential for competitiveness and financial growth. So they see this somewhat differently. And so what, they, what some of the old guard, I would probably be stuck in that, quite thick into that, what the old guard might interpret as re rebellion is actually the younger generation striving to be vocal and live out the principles that they believe in. It's just a very interesting study if you have a chance to read it. So there are many factors that contribute to women and underrepresented groups not full contribute to the science and engineering enterprise, and many of you, I'm sure, have heard many of these factors, cultural expectations, microaggressions, heavier service loads, being on every possible search committee out there, uh, family obligations, inadequate mentoring, and implicit biases to focus just on these. And what that le leads to, then, is a heavier weight for our underrepresented groups of women as they try to climb up that ladder a way that oftentimes loss causes them to leave the ladder prematurely. Let me just say a couple of things about inadequate mentoring and implicit biases. So mentorship is really, really important. And that's where we oftentimes have disadvantages. Mentorships of underrepresented groups face, they face a lot of challenges, limited access to mentors. Think about this when you're at this meeting. And so we need to be able to create mentors, and so the mentorship workshops that I've been involved in and training with uh, JGI, we talk a lot about mentorship, and particularly about the three kinds of mentorship. Coach, who coaches you on a topic, short term. A sponsor who celebrates you, talks about you, and nominates you for awards, helps you with promotions. 
and then more the long-term mentor and the role that each of us can play. So if you're not comfortable being a long-term mentor, then be a coach, be a sponsor. It's a lot easier, but boy, is it high impact because we all need all three of those. I wouldn't be anywhere where I am now if it weren't for those three uh, helping along the way. A coach talks to you, a sponsor talks about you, and a mentor speaks with you. So this issue of implicit bias uh, is a problem. I'm sure many of you have heard about this, but it's really our unconscious biases that are there. It influences our expectations, both men and women. We start to think in terms of stereotypes. We think so quickly that we rely on those biases rather than thinking deeply, which is why when you're on a search committee and you're doing search files that you do not do them quickly because your biases come into play, you need to do them slowly and spend time with them. And they're held regardless of race or gender. When I heard last week, I was on a, at a symposium at Columbia University last week where Brian Nozick, who many of you may know, or some of you may know, has really been a leader in implicit bias with regards to gender stereotyping and, and sex stereotyping. And he talked a lot about the implicit bias in research and the incredible, and put out the, uh, some of the work that talked about the irreproducibility of many areas of medicinal research as well as in uh, the social sciences that the biases are actually within us even when we do our science and we have to fight really hard to make sure that those aren't there. And what better way to fight that than to have a diverse group of people working with us that bring different backgrounds, different views, so that we don't, so that we uh, have a broader view of how we choose the groups we study, how we choose them, or the protocols we use, and so forth. And we do have, to finish up, we have uh, examples of many failures where those Biases by one particular homogeneous group have kicked in. Airbags, early airbags, developed largely by male engineers, kill, kill off women and children. Fortunately, we don't have those big heavy ones around anymore. Or the heart valves that worked fine for men, but were much too large for women. Or the voice recognition systems, where they were calibrated for men's voices but didn't really recognize women's voices and actually African-American voices too. I once had a, a guy say to me, oh, is that why my wife is such a bad driver? I said, I don't, maybe not. And finally, web, web algorithm biases. For those that have developed web, web algorithm biases, they tend to show on when you do a search, they've tended to show for women jobs that are low paying and men see jobs that are high paying. So to finish off, let me go back to my point, innovation on high impact research, it requires good leadership, sponsorship, teamwork and communication, thrives on diversity, flourishes in inclusive, supportive environment, and most important there, if any, is the good leadership and sponsorship. And so I hope that we all go forward, figuring out leader doesn't have to just to be at the top. You can be a leader of a group, a leader of a team, make sure that you are engaging everyone and have diverse opinions because science is better that way. So why bother? Because our best science is critical. And your field of, of study, your field of research in genomics is just right in front when it comes to important science for, for us today and for the future. We need to all work hard to make sure we do it in the best way and have diversity help us. I thank you very much. I wish you the best for the rest of the meeting, and thank you for letting me learn a little bit more about genomics.